All right, we all believe in tritium now, right? So I think, uh, I think it's a foregone conclusion that uh, there is tritium in these in these cells, and we're continuing to work on it. The the uh, real direction is not to generate tritium if you extrapolate all these results and you, you think you're going to have a hundred megawatt reactor sometime in the next to the few years. You would generate maybe only a hundred series of tritium. Okay, that's, that's not me. The regulatory limit I could have a you know in my pocket a thousand years. So it's not a real danger. The neutrons might be a little bit more of a danger, so you want to find materials that don't have this uh, that, that have this low uh, N over T ratio, which is kind of a, a given, but you also want to reduce that tritium. So what you want is heat without tritium. Uh, what we're gonna show is that uh, and, and what, what Ray started originally was measuring neutrons, okay, which was very unsuccessful. So we went to tritium after Ed got his tritium results, and it's very fast, and we, we were able to see uh, tritium results. Now the, the, the thing is, is that uh, what we're doing now is we're screening materials for activity. Tritium is the most sensitive way to see if there's an effect. And we know it's always associated with some excess heat. So you screen materials, you find out what works, what doesn't, and maybe you know we'll find out what Rossi is using too uh, at some point. But uh, it's it's fast. It takes maybe 24 to 48 hours to look at the material. So uh, I'm just going to dance through this. This uh, uh, you know, here is all of this uh, sort of stuff. But we did a lot of. Uh, Work too in the beginning. We did some uh, powder uh, wire cells, then we did wire cells, then we did fusion experiments, then we went on to plasma. And one thing I've never talked about was um, a case work, okay, where we uh, looked for tritium out of the case uh, experiment. So, uh, what we've done here is we've done pico curies per hour per gram. So, that's kind of a uh, uh, bigger merit. You want that to be big if you want to see tritium or you want to see an effect. Uh, if you don't want tritium, you, you want excess heat. But uh, for what we want to do right now is we want to compare all of these different systems. And the most efficient thing that we've seen is uh, the plasma, okay? So we've had up to 530 uh, picocuries per hour per gram out of those systems. That's why we're screening the materials in a plasma system. And these are all fast, short, high-powered pulses. This was a heating and a discharge on this uh, diffusion cell. And then this was just uh, fast, uh, this was just heating, okay? Uh, so the neutron to tritium ratio we measured in these cells to be three times to the minus eight. Uh, and we didn't know that, okay? We, we found out later that this was uh, the low ratio. I mean, we, we were sitting on this result because we didn't believe it. Uh, and, then, and then recently, uh, maybe we're seeing some heat in these plasma cells. Maybe it's 3%. I'm not sure I believe it yet. Uh, it could be, uh, could be much less than that, but it's, uh, it's interesting at any rate. So this is uh, an eye chart. It shows all of the, not all of the materials that we've used, but a lot of the different alloys. Okay, so in the beginning we did uh, palladium, and we were looking at pure palladium batches, and of course pure palladium batches, 99.999 from Alpha and, and Goodfellow. They're not pure. They have all sorts of impurities in them. Uh, the ones that have impurities were generating tritium, uh, more tritium than the pure batches. So we went off to make all these alloys, and then we did just pure metals, pure metals again, uh, I have to warn you that, that they uh, that they have all sorts of impurities as well. So uh, uh, the the best one was this particular thing right up here: palladium, rhodium, cobalt, boron. Okay, and we did a lot. We concentrated on that one because that one gave us the most uh, results, uh, the highest tritium results. Uh, but this number here, uh, 0.045. Uh, that's the first time I think anybody's seen this in a, in a conference. That's, that's a low number for the boron. And uh, later I'll show uh, a sample of that, uh, that that was active. So uh, they also show some activity except uh, maybe this uh, silver 
uh, iron, zirconia, niobium. Uh, but nickel works. Okay, so here's a here's one of these. Um, uh, I, I think this sort of canonical. I, I don't have the. Um, I guess this uh, this thing might do something, but. You can see the holes in these uh, in these samples. You can also see the disparities, microstructure. We can't see in this is a lot of little fissures uh, between these uh, things. And uh, let's see if this works. Oh, no, it didn't work. Okay. Uh, but there's another uh, view graph behind this. Okay. That <laughs> shows those samples <laughs> and uh, the samples of uh, palladium, rhodium, cobalt, boron, and they've got holes in them. And that was where. Uh, palladium was being evaporated uh, from those uh, sites, so very tiny sites, okay, uh, where we had a lot of activity. And during that time, we had ionization, which we don't normally see in the system, and the tritium uh, level was up by an order of magnitude over the normal material uh, that we see. So uh, this is a plasma cell here for testing materials. This is Two millimeters by about an inch by 20,000. So we just put, we don't need much material. If you've got an alloy, uh, we can throw it in there and find out whether it's active right away. Uh, that's um, the beginning of a, a plasma going up this and being attached to that material. It actually, when it's running, it doesn't quite look like that. It's not spectacular. Um, the other thing that uh, might be interesting is to make some alloys of uh, these materials, palladium, antimony, platinum, we know platinum works, cobalt of course is in, in present in that, that material that we, we had that was active, and rhodium. So a lot of people are sort of zeroing in on these things right now. Um, things that don't work are over there. And this is from um, Rayola, uh, his shielding uh, experiments. So uh, going on, um, this is, I don't want to go through the mechanisms how we actually detect the tritium because I think everybody knows what those are, uh, but this is a gas, um, this is a gas experiment. This is one of these uh, ones where we can, we can run it for a few hours, this one was run for uh, uh, say 80 hours, and you can see a delta in the tritium uh, quite nicely. So again, uh, you put that small sample in there, you run it for a day or two days or three days, and you can get a result. Um, now this is something that is pretty new, although uh, Romanidoff did have this um, in 1999, and we didn't believe his results. Uh, nobody believes anybody's results, but <laughs> that's, that's a problem. So right here, we're, we're seeing this uh, peak in the output uh, versus a deuterium fraction. So if you don't want tritium, you might run complete hydrogen or complete deuterium. Of course, complete deuterium will have some tritium in it. But we're peaking up at, uh, at 15 to 20%. This is another graph of the uh, tritium output as a function of D2 fraction for this G75. And uh, when we got this, we thought, well, this must be an error. So it's just linear like this. <laughs> and, and now I'm, I'm rethinking that. Okay, so uh, I think that 25 to 20 percent range is where um, we would get enhanced tritium production. Of course, you don't want that if you're going to have a big reactor uh, and uh, generate power. Now, this is something that Jed said that resonated to me um, yesterday. And it was, well, we make these unwarranted assumptions that this is all tritium, okay? And uh, or we make assumptions that this is tritium. We, we know part of this is tritium, okay? This, this, the, the tritium output should be just constant in the scintillation counter. Uh, but there seems to be another component that's not uh, quenching, it's not uh, chemical luminescence. This is a very long time, and then it falls down. So we're seeing something build up, and then it comes back down. We've only just seen this recently, and this is after the after the experiment. This is not during the experiment. This is after we captured all the tritium. So there may be some other uh, activity in these in these samples that we don't know about yet, okay, or we haven't uh, actually explored. 
Uh, one of the things that you want to you want to do is you want to have heat. Uh, you want to measure tritium and heat simultaneously, or you want to measure radiation and tritium simultaneously because nobody again believes that you have if you have just one thing like heat, nobody will believe it. So. Uh, what we're trying to do is look for uh, radiation and tritium. Uh, neutrons are too hard to find because they're, they're too low. Uh, and uh, this is what we get in uh, nickel samples. Okay. Um, this is so nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is what we get in nickel samples. Um, we have activity that only lasts for maybe 24 hours. Or so. so after this, the activity is very low, and I've seen this a number of times. If you run these samples longer and longer, the output is lower and lower. But in the beginning, you've got some activity. Now this is actually uh, radioactive uh, uh, emissions. And uh, the next slide is the this is the time dependence of that. So we're dropping. Um, we don't want to count this after 24 hours because you're not going to see much. But this is the difference in the two spectra that you just you just saw back there. One is um, out here at the uh, extreme time, and then very close uh, in we were taking these uh, these radiation measurements. So take the difference of the spectra of these um, at the uh, at, at those times, and what we see is something here, maybe uh, 200 kilovolts and below is what we're, what we're looking at. Um, so this is easy to shield. So if you have a copper uh, shield, you can you get rid of this radiation. But again, uh, this kind of uh, excess heat that you might see out of this is just a few uh, milliwatts. And so if you have a 10 kilowatt generator, this might be kind of an annoyance. Um, so you, have to, you do have to shield this uh, because I think that would uh, that would be more dangerous than the uh, tritium at this point. Um, the other thing that we typically do is after the plasma experiments, we will count the powder. We'll generate some powder, and this, this powder is a little bit active. So this is, this is sort of background. This is nickel and nickel alloy powders. That's palladium powder. And if you do the statistics on here, it's you know nothing to write home about. It's, it's a little bit less than two sigmas, almost two sigma. Uh, difference. All right, so now we're going to go to some excess heat uh, work that we're just starting with coalescence. And this is a plasma cell that can fit into a calorimeter. When we measure the current, the voltage, it's all pulsed. And uh, uh, these are, this is uh, very early results. We're talking about a, a resistor here. Of course, this is going on for quite some time. This is a nickel sample, and this is a nickel conetic sample. This is a magnetic shield, same uh, particular alloy of nickel. Um, and then this line here is the slope of this guy, which would come back to the resistor if we thought that was real after about um, 10,000 hours or more. So uh, what I think right now is not that, uh, oops, this is a, uh, Maybe this is real, uh, you know, this would be a 300 milliwatt signal. Uh, but uh, there is a little uh, thing in the beginning uh, of these that you have to look at very carefully, and that, that might be the actual heat signal. Okay, that would be the more conservative uh, number. Tom, Tom, what's your y axis? Is that power? Or what, what are we oh, you know, that y axis is, uh, just talk to me about that. All right, come back. <laughs> the thing, you know, this is a, this is a just the, the point to remember is that there's a difference between the resistor, there's a difference between the nickel, there's a difference between the magnetic. Okay, and that's the error. The error is way less. Okay, so you're seeing a real effect here, or it could be a real artifact. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you that. Okay. So so one of the other things we do is we look for helium. And uh, we have a really nice uh, mass spec at the, at the lab. It's a big Finnegan uh, thing, but uh, we just started on this. So we're seeing a little bit of helium. I'm not sure that this is, this is real either, but we're gonna redo some of those experiments. And uh, that would, I think, be pretty definitive. 
Uh, so here's our conclusions. The nickel alloy is reproducible. This is a pretty uh, big deal for us because now we can uh, reliably look at this, the, uh, uh, the H to B ratio, okay? Uh, tritium can be uh, several sigma or many sigma over the background. And uh, the other, the other big, big uh, advance here, which is an incremental advance, if you you know would listen to these uh, venture capitalists, <laughs> is that this is incremental. Okay, we're look, we're screening these materials for activity. We haven't seen anything really big, but we might see something really big. And if we do, that's that's a bonanza. But we don't require much material. Your big uh, Milton Roy cell was a huge thing. Okay. This requires 150 milligrams of sample. Uh, so this excess heat so far is small, but it's not inconsistent with the helium. And if the uh, X-ray effect uh, can be big enough, and we know when to do it, right, 24 hours or you know less than 24 hours uh, after we turn the cell on, it could it could serve as a, a demo. So there's a lot of parameter space here, a lot of materials um, that have only been partially explored. And what we're doing is we're searching for this. That's the magic material. What, what is it? But uh, palladium and nickel both work. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I don't like to leave on magic. Uh, <laughs> no, or maybe I, I do. Uh, I'm going to hold the floor open for questions for about 10 minutes, but those of you who have our Skinner tour arranged, please go out to the lobby and join your uh, tour. Um, does anybody have a question for any of the any of the uh, panelists? So my, my question is, how easy is it to separate uh, tritium production from tritium enrichment? And is that done in the case? Can that be done easily in the case? How to separate tritium enrichment uh, from production? Yeah, it's, uh, it's maybe not that simple. That's why that uh, that case material work we didn't we didn't really publish that uh, because there is an enrichment factor, and you that's a little bit complicated to do. So there's more work to be done there. On the uh, in the electrolytic cell, they can do the enrichment uh, in this uh, gas loading. There's no problem with that. Anybody else with a, with a pressing uh, question? A coffee break demo, something that happens within 15 minutes. Okay. And, and you know, the attention span of your PC guy is 15 minutes, so you're gonna, you're gonna have to convince them in that time period. Or your manager, okay, so. I have to, I have to give this question to Tom Passett, who funded most of my work. Well, it's a long time ago, and I thank you for reminding me. Um, I'd like to ask the question to uh, Tom Clayton. Uh, you're very good on uh, measuring all the details of the alloys, but uh, I don't know to what extent you dealt with the, the minor impurities. And uh, so you have, but the minor impurity that I'm most concerned or interested in is lithium, okay? Lithium-6 with deuterons will make tritium from the DP reaction. And uh, so uh, I was looking in, in vain, I guess, so far for any possible correlation between lithium content, even at the part per million level, and your uh, result for making tritium. Okay, so the lithium, there was a lithium-palladium alloy up there, but it was natural lithium. And that one works. It works to some degree. It's not any better than those other ones. Um, lithium uh, lithium contamination in some of the early uh, materials was uh, looked at, uh, so we know what those were. But in the recent alloys, I don't have any. I don't have any uh, special. You know, we haven't done that. We haven't looked way down there, parts per million. But that was it. A 0.05 percent lithium sample. If you get it, if you make it, if you put more lithium in it, you think, well, okay, it's better. No, that's not better. It's uh, you, you actually are doping the palladium. So 0.05 works better than 10 percent. 
Thank you. But you've never attempted isotopic enhancement? No. You addressed something that's shown up several times today, and I'd like to quiz you about your feeling about that. You're pretty honest about uh, saying this is questionable or not. Uh, the point that the radiation is there and then it disappears over time is sort of the concept that Rossi brought up and a lot of people have and stuff like that. But it says when you start up, you get radiation and then it goes away. And you actually, I think, raised the point that it looks like something else is there or is building up. And it looks like you're building up a scavenger. And we see these things where all of a sudden you get fairly quick drops. And so it looks like at that point, something turns on. You're developing something, then it turns on. And we've seen things where you have sharp spikes of activity. And during those sharp spikes of activity, you may be producing something that's a scavenger. There's no way to correlate these, correlate these things, I think, with the data we have. But it's something to look for in the future. Do you have any thoughts? And I've got thoughts about what that scavenger is. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, you know, that's a hard question, but uh, very, very valid. And at these levels, I, I don't even want to think about it yet. Okay, when, when this is bigger, maybe, uh, maybe we can, you know, figure out what it is. So it's another mystery uh, that we have to solve. Okay, there's plenty of mysteries in this field. Well, one of the problems we have in this field is that the same uh, result that is tritium and neutrons can be made several different ways and they can occur simultaneously. So you can have hot fusion occurring as fractal fusion, you can have cold fusion occurring by its whatever mystery makes it. And they can be occurring simultaneously and they can be making the same products. And so the problem is to sort them out from a particular experiment. So some experiments make only cold fusion and some experiments make only hot fusion. That is, titanium makes only hot fusion, really. Plating can make both. And so it becomes a, a challenge to figure out this puzzle. So when you ask these questions, um, you may be mixing apples and oranges. And so we can't necessarily focus just the answer on cold fusion. Well, it looked like, anyhow, I appreciated seeing the data on the x-ray, uh, the time sequence. Was that that's a, that looks like it's pretty solid data. And really yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty new data, too. Thank you. Do you have anything, either you or Ed, have anything to say about the size of the particles and the effects? Um, and given the Iran experiment that uh, Mike ran, given your work, uh, you've got everything from sort of fag nanometer uh, scale palladium. To what extent do we know anything about the effect of size of the particles in the experiments having an effect on the pollution? So those, in, those initial powder results, the, the, there was a lot of powder in there and we, we had a significant amount of tritium. Uh, those were um, 500 nanometer particles. And uh, then you're looking at all those cracks, uh, which I didn't show because that slide thing didn't go, but um, you saw the ones in from Srinivasan's and you saw where the tritium was coming from. So the cracks are, uh, you know, they can be from zero to some, some large size. So you have distribution in that. Uh, a rod, as I recall, is sort of 20, 20 to 50 nanometers. And palladium black, I don't know what the scale is on it. Yeah, plain black usually uh, the stuff that we've seen is uh, 10 to 20 nanometers. But uh, I, don't, I don't see any, uh, you know, I just don't know what the lower limit would be on that. What is the present thinking, I guess, and Ed is the best uh, able to answer, the present thinking, uh, Marcus always believed that his Tritium production is associated with those uh, dendrites and therefore a very small dimension uh, occurrence. What, what, what is the present thinking on that point? Well, I don't think the, the dendrites themselves are necessarily the active site. They really, at least 
based upon the various models, don't have a uniform application to anything. Um, however, it did change the surface in various ways, electrochemically as well as uh, structurally. And there were just not, not only dendrites there, there were other things as well. <clears throat> so it's, it's hard to know, but dendrites do not seem to be everywhere when tritium is made. Any further questions? If not, I suggest we thank the panel um, for a very Thank you very much. Uh,